Well, it's the fifth day of judging, and that means it's the one that everyone's most looking forward to, generally speaking, at least judging by the number of entries this category gets, black and white. So we're going to go right in here with a photo from Ken Anderson, which is an interesting black and white composition compared to the rest of the... In it's an interesting black and white composition, like writ large, but within the boundaries of this annual contest, there were only a few people who used fog or haze, grayscale, like sort of a muddy scene contrast in their compositions. And this is something that can work really well in black and white, much more so than in color photos, for sure. So what we have here is we have this distant tree line, what lo looks like it's probably across a farm field in, honestly, this looks like an early morning fog, but like that sun is really high up in the sky for it being early morning. So at any rate, within a fog. And one of the really cool things about black and white photography and fog is that uh, you can make things, you can completely change their nature because black and white strips away their color information and then adding fog strips away their, their tonal information, which is largely where we perceive depth from. So one of the things I think that's really done very well here is the picking of this scene with this tree and tree line. And we can't tell if this tree line is moving toward or away from us. The overall composition of the flat, dark foreground with the tree line in the background is really nice. And then this general gray, uh, the sky, which is a mixture of different grayscales. Really enjoy the use of all of those elements, the way that the image is constructed here and uh, the way that the fog is used as an image altering element. All of that really well done. Only nitpicky thing here to point out is the uh, blurry plants right in front of the tree are a little bit distracting. Um, one question would, would be if there was a way to go back to the scene in this, this environmental condition, what would happen if the you stepped a little bit to the left or to the right? Imagine if those plants either weren't in the frame or if they were off to the right or left side of the frame. Would that, how would that change the composition and would that make it more or less pleasing than having them placed where they are? So, but that's, that's the, I mean, look, this is a strong competition this year, guys. This is, uh, all of the photos submitted had some significant strengths in them, um, but uh, wait till you see the honorable mentions and the two winners. This is, this was tough this year. So, but other than that, like, I really think that the way that the elements were used here worked very nicely for this photo. Next up from Luca Pizzini, we have a photo of an old sink in the shadows of a plant. Black and white photography is something that really can do very well with shadows as an element. Because since there's only tone data, then the shadows don't... Like, I mean, they're never going to cast a color, but they don't distract from the image. Sh shadows in color photography can, in some settings, distract from a photo because they don't have color data. In a black and white photo, then the shape of the shadows, especially when it's an interesting shadow like this one, and when you have multiple layers of shadows, the sharp focus of the plant and the soft focus of a more distant plant, that adds a lot of depth and uh, tonal interest to a scene. So. I think the use of shadows here is done really well, and I think especially the use of sharp focus or sharper focus and blurry shadows to show that there is a depth outside of this image is really uh, an exceptional use of shadows for, the, for this shot. From McCool, we have a photo of a farm with someone's name scratched into the, um, into the barn, or into the fence rather, in front of the barn. The use of focus here is really interesting to me because it's a good job of capturing, you know, we've got this diagonal name, right? And which looks like it's probably Callie and Jack or something like that, uh, or Kaylee and Jack, whatever it may be. Um, and though the name is in focus, the K might be a little bit soft and maybe a little bit past Kaylee is in focus, but at any rate, the the name is in focus. And then that's exactly what's in focus. Then the background is out of focus and soft. So um, 
you know, if you've seen the other other years competitions that we where I've talked about the use of words in in images, they can become a distracting thing. In this, because I think that's the point of the image, it's I don't think a distracting distracting image element. And then the the background being like this sort of semi soft, almost kind of dreamlike state. I think that the overall message, uh, the overall feeling of this image, both of those are, are really pretty well executed. Um, so there's there's not really a whole lot I would say to do differently or not with this image. So one of the interesting things, looking at this image, you can see all of those ghosts going diagonally from the top right down to the bottom left. All those internal reflections tell us that there's a lot of glass in this lens. Um, also looks kind of like an older manual focus, retro focus design lens based on those ghosts and the overall image blurriness characteristic. Uh, anyway, again, like I've said in previous videos, this is one of the things I always find really interesting about you, the photos everyone sends in is what types of gear are people using and how is that gear contributing to the image aesthetic, right? And so I think in this setting, this is one of those times where the use of gear really does a good job of complementing the image and the message that the image is trying to convey. So well done on, on those elements of this for sure. Next up from, uh, from Jimista, we have another photo of Pittsburgh. And I gotta say, there's some things going on here that are really working very well. As we saw in the first video, there's a bit of haze in the distance there, and that's really nice image element, especially compared to how clear and in focus the buildings up at the front are. I think the uh, the bridge is a really interesting photographic subject as well. So there are a couple things to look at that if there were a chance to go back and re-photograph the bridge might be worth seeing. How could, how could these be structured differently? So some of the distracting elements in the foreground, right, because it's so sharp and then the background is so hazy that our eyes are, are sort of drawn to the foreground, at least mine are. So we have the yoga sign and then the, the building sign down there. Those are a little bit distracting again because words. The um, bottom has like the cropped building roof on the bottom left, then some car tops and then the lamp posts on the bottom right. So if we were to recrop this just a little bit, bring the right side in to cut off that group of three windows at that second separation between the second and third windows there, just kind of draw that line down the, the middle of that and then bring up the bottom just a hair. How would that how would that look if we got rid of some of the distracting stuff along the very bottom of the, the foreground? And then the other question is, you know, the bridge is what well, seems to be what the photo's focusing on, and it's an interesting structure. But in terms of image real estate, it's really not all that big of an image element. It's the biggest individual element, but it's not the majority. So it, it is showing the bridge in the setting of, of Pittsburgh, but it isn't the dominant part of the photo. So a question might be, how else could this bridge be photographed? You know, the, the landscape on the other side of the, the bridge goes up a hill. Is there a place diagonal from where this photo was taken where the bridge could be photographed and, and the camera could be kept level? And then what's behind us where we're standing right here could be in the photo. I feel like that might change the entire relationship of the bridge with the setting. Might be just worth considering how that bridge fits into Pittsburgh. And and one of the things, it's, it's really hard to do with a bridge and any sort of large subject, but as an idea for photographing an object, if you're going to find an object like an old tractor in a field or whatever, and you go out there and you photograph it, before you take your first photo, walk 360 degrees around it if you can do so safely and legally. Obviously hard to do with a bridge. So um, that's a good practice to be in when taking a photo to see how is this, this object fitting into the surrounding setting and, and what other way besides my, my first reaction could I, I fit it in. Now all of that said, what's behind the, the vantage point here might not be worth taking a photo of. This may be the best vantage point for that bridge. But um, for those of us who, who don't know that for sure, it's worth uh, a good practice to see how all of a, a subject could be photographed from different angles uh, as we're, we're in the process of taking that photo. 
from Trevor Duff, we have a photo of some bayou, marsh type setting, hard to say. Um, a really interesting setting, right? It's it's this is an image that has a lot of like sort of busyness, but the overall structure of it is is fairly simple, right? If you break this down to tones and shapes, we have dark triangle on the bottom right. We have this very interesting shape of this tree, which spans basically the entire photo. And then in the background, we have various shades of, of darks to bright whites of really good use of the entire zone system spectrum. Uh, and also a lot of use of different shapes, long vertical things hanging down, the reflection changing the shape of the tree behind it, the horizontal uh, either little peninsula or or fallen tree in the background at the base of that tree, something like that. Uh, so so there's a lot of dynamism in this image going from very close to very far, a lot of use of tone and a lot of use of detail and sharpness. And, and from a use of the zone scale perspective, this is like a really great example of how full use of the zone system can be a, a beneficial to an image in the same way that the first photo we saw showed that you know having a, a an image that hangs out mostly in the middle range of the zone system can also be a really captivating image all of which is to say there's no one right way to use the tools at your disposal when you're taking photos so i think the composition here and all of those details work really well and honestly like when it I, You've probably heard me say this in other videos, like busy subjects are hard to photograph well, but you know what? This is an example of how a busy scene can be photographed in a good and interesting manner because this is a photo that is really pleasant to look at. Next up from Eunice Beiser, we have a photo of a church building. Churches and old buildings like this are uh, perennially good subjects for black and white photos. Why? Because black and white lives in the realm of tone and texture. Like those are two of the key elements of black and white photography. And what we have here is a nice wide array of tones and some really interesting textures being used in the photograph. So you can see the texture, the, the windows are smooth. The bricks or the stone rather of the structure are not. The roof has a different texture than the, the stones. The carvings in the bottom right and then the bricks and things like that. So there are lots and lots of different tones and textures at play here, and they are all working well together. So that aspect of it is really doing well. When looking at this photo though, you can see that the verticals are all skewing off to the left, which indicates two things. One, that the camera was lifted upward and that the photographer was at an angle to the subject, which is reinforced by the uh, direction of the horizontals, which are converging away and off to the lower left of the photo. And so it ends up being a very disorienting photo. As a, it's an architecture photo, you know, it's it's not meeting the, the technical, the requirements of vertical verticals and all that. Is a black and white photo? It doesn't necessarily have to. The question is, is the intent to make this subject feel askew? Is it an intentional to make the viewer feel like sort of at ease, uh, I'm sorry, ill at ease rather, by the the angle of the building. And I don't know the answer to that. I do think that the eye for tone and texture and the eye for this subject is an interesting black and white photographer, photo photograph, all working really, really well in this setting. From Johan Beery, we have a photo, an interior architectural photo, and it's so, got a bit of a sepia toning to it. It's subtle, but it's there. And again, as we talked about with the church photo, we have a range of tones, various textures. And, and by the way, this is something you're going to see throughout this whole video. You guys are doing a really good job of mixing tones and textures in your black and white photos. And that's not easy to do. So kudos, by the way, across the board on doing that. Uh, and we also here have interior depth. Again, things that are up close, that drum thing that's in the distance that is far away. From a technical perspective, this photo is really checking all of the important boxes for architectural photo, uh, for an architectural photo. From a black and white photo perspective, again, we're checking all the boxes on an interesting, visually compelling composition. 
what's going on outside the door, really nice exterior lighting coming in and giving us natural and soft lighting within this interior space. So another thing that's done really well here, a good use of scene lighting. So uh, just really pleasantly well executed and a good overall photo. So from Rich Mander, we have a photo of a the Mia men's outlet. We have a curious placement of the photographer's reflection in the window as well. And uh, a photo of the three mannequins. And they are very bright white in this otherwise dark setting. And repeating a chorus from throughout this video, really nice mixture of tone and texture. Smooth glass, textured stone, carved stone. Also really dark shadows right next to really bright whites. Echoing a couple of the other videos, really at a strong angle here doesn't necessarily feel like an intentional angle because the, the name of this uh, store up at the top and over on the left, those are a little bit cut off. Um, but if you imagine this being sort of straightened out, right? And so, so, so let's think about how we could crop this, straighten it so that the, the line along the top is level. And then bring the crop down so that we get rid of that camera up there and, and at least the sign that says Mia up at the top. Then that would, uh, that would just make everything feel a little bit more level and balanced, but wouldn't sacrifice most of the interesting elements of the photograph. So just a thing to think about if you're out walking and past this, this shop again. From Harrison Fisher, we have a picture of a trail going off into the woods. Clearly a, a film photo, really lovely use of grain in this image. And, um, and also a, an okay use of the tonal range. You have some dark shadows and you have some shadow retention, and some shadow information retention in the trees on the right side and the shadows they're casting. The texture throughout, the, the grain is really complementary to the grass and the gravel texture, as well as the tree bark texture and the complexity of all of the, um, the tree leaves in the scene. And so, I, so a lot of the things that make up black and white photos are being done in this photo to a fairly decent extent and all of that's pretty good you know the the question is like what what is the what what is the trail leading to because right now it looks like it's leading to this interesting tree up ahead a couple of things to that if you're you know if you have the opportunity to come back here and if you're with a person imagine this photo with a person walking toward the camera in the scene, either looking at the trees or, you know, something like that, not necessarily looking at the camera. That's kind of like a, an intimidating move. I guess it could be done well, but, but think about having somebody walking toward this. If you have a tripod with you, set up your tripod, set the self timer, and you can walk toward the camera and try, you know, six different shots, looking at the camera, at the trees, at the ground, at the sky, different things like that. And I think you might find that the inclusion of a person in a scene like this ups the visual appeal because people in photos generally do up the visual appeal, especially in a setting like this. In the same vein, from Robert Thornson, we have a photo in a similar setting with two people. Looks like an elderly couple, judging by the cane and, and stances, walking away from the camera. So what we have is an, a use of a use of subject orientation and placement that feels like an intentional aim to show that these subjects are walking toward the end of their lives, maybe not immediately, but in they're at least retired or close to it, probably well retired, and they are doing so together. So, you know, there's, there's, you've almost certainly heard someone say this life is a path or a journey or whatever. And so we can see that these people are walking down it and because they are facing away from us and, and well down this path, they are further along this path than, than us as viewers. And I think this is a really good way of using setting with subject to convey a message and a story in the photo. And that's something that is a really good skill to teach yourself is how to tell a story with a photo. It's, it's, I think the highest level of photos are those that tell a story visually, that, that 
everyone can look at a photo and get the same basic meaning from that photo. That's the, the highest level of goal that I, I think photographers can aspire to. And that's something that's being executed well in this shot. From Milan Setic, we have a landscape seascape view of some distant mountains and some, some water in the foreground. A little bit of motion blur in the image here. If you look at the mountain ridges, it looks like there's a little bit of a horizontal blur there. I'm not sure that's unintentional. It does look like it's a little bit intentional, like um, meant to intentionally cause some sideways motion in the textures of the image. And that makes this whole landscape not a technical landscape, but an exploration of the shapes and textures within landscape. And I've, I've done this too, and I think it's a really enjoyable and fun way to take a sit, real setting and change the image from being something that, you know, any of a dozen people standing in the same spot could take to an image that, that shows in a more artistic and abstract manner the setting that's, that's being photographed. So I think that's a really neat use of intentional blur. And the grain in the film photo here really offsets that intentional blur by the grain being present and not blurry. From Stephen Boski, we have an absolutely lovely um, environmental portrait of two people. One person who's just looking at their phone and the other person who's looking off at something. We don't know what outside of frame. One person who's just kind of wrapped up in their own world and the other person who is engaged in some way, shape or form with the rest of the world around them. And absolutely, uh, like real quickly, we'll hammer out the technical things, right? really knocking this out of the park from a technical perspective. Very well done. And great, great use of tones, textures, the, everything from the textures and tones of the building to of the people's skin tones, the textures of their clothes, one who has a patterned but smooth texture fabric, the other who has a, a patterned in some places but smooth uh, single color but textured fabric, just like all of these things are, are set aside into opposition. Dark and light, smooth and textured, really excellently well done in that regard. Also just an overall captivating photo to look at. I think this is an exceptionally well executed photo. Uh, you might be wondering why isn't this an honorable mention? Darn near was, really darn near was. Uh, I think when we get to those, you'll see that they they are a little bit, you know, they, they just do a couple of things differently, but this is, a photo that quite honestly, if if I had taken this photo, I would be very proud of the result from this. This is exceptionally well executed. From Francesco Coppola, we are uh, like absolutely diving into the black and white theme here with this photo and uh, in a way that is really, really well executed. So very dark skinned model, very white, uh, white sheets, and then like a mirroring of the tones throughout those the subject and the sheets in the surrounding setting. Going into the mirror, right? The mirror is also bright and dark. And so the mirror becomes a mirror of the tones within the photo. Really well thought out and, and nice execution there. So from an image composition, image structure perspective, really well done. One thing that I think that, that I struggled with, with in this shot in particular is that the dark tones feel kind of muddy. I mean, they're, they're not because they're dark, but they, there's not much of a tonal variation within the model, especially, uh, that makes, that makes the use of the darkness really pop from the rest of the photo. Because a lot of the, the like, if you if you see like the the shape of her of her torso, the way that um, like the the crease where her hip is, or even the way that the lights are reflect you know reflected or not reflected off of her, they don't really like the tonal gradation within her skin isn't amplifying her form in in any way shape or form that may just be because of the film. And this is a really high grain film, and I'm not sure if this is a significant crop or it does kind of have that look of either being a significant crop or maybe like a one, not quite a 110 photo, but 
maybe crop down to that size, or if it's just because this is a very, very expired film and it required a lot of pushing to get to the point where it could return a usable image. Um, so I'd be really curious to see how this would have turned out on something like a, like a Delta 100 or something smoother than the grain that that's in this image and how, um, if you can imagine lighting this from above with like a really soft, soft box and just using that light to, to bleach out the whiteness of the sheets a little bit more, especially in the background, but also to cast some lights on, on say her arm and shoulders, the shape of her legs and, and, and uh, abdomen and things like that. That would be, that I think would have been a, uh, an interesting use of light that would have prevented some of the lack of detail that, that this image is, is being overpowered by due to the, the film. Other than that, like the composition, like we talked about at the beginning, the composition is really spot on. I think the, the use of a lot of straight lines, a lot of dominant verticals and horizontals in opposition to the curves of the, of the female figure, and then the, the, the general curving nature of the mirror and mirror surround in the background really do make for the overall composition to be a very interesting presentation of the subject. From Blue Moon Kiss Love, we have a photo of a, a couple of benches, one of them really being the dominant bench in what looks like a garden. And then, oh, what just noticed, what is that interesting art, uh, thing down along the bottom? I'm not sure what's going on down at the bottom of the image, but I, I am really curious about that. It looks almost like damage to the film, hard to say. Um, anyway, so a couple of things we'll... we'll jump into right, right off the bat. I can't tell if the, at first, you know, some of the posts, I can't tell if they are cockeyed or if there's a bit of an angle to the way that the camera's held. The one off on the right, which looks like it's about to fall over is particularly distracting. Um, and then, you know, we, we, one of the other things is that I think focus here is slightly missed. So if you look down at the bottom left, next to the path, there's this, uh, looks like tulips maybe, or some other type of flower. Those are like really in sharp focus. And then I think what should be in focus is that bench, but it's a hair past the focus point. And so the, the focus itself was missed. And then one of the things that I think, one of the things that is really interesting about the way that this photo was taken is it was taken wide open. We can tell that by the nature of the blurry area around the perimeter and the way that the, uh, especially the corners have become pretty smeary. And uh, I think shooting this subject wide open could be a really good uh, execution of this image because of the, the way that the lens is going to perform at that setting. So, if we think about a potential revision here, uh, stand closer to the bench, or actually even better, don't stand, kneel closer to the bench, so that the bench becomes like the center of the uh, of this photo and a bit more. Now, if you imagine reframing this so that that's what is that second pillar in from the right side becomes what is, imagine all of those flowers up at the top of it becoming the right upper right corner of the image. Now that would make the, the bench much more of the main image. And then the lens being shot wide open would take care of sort of the busyness of the background by making it a lot more blurry. So uh, it would be interesting to think about, about that as a recomposition. The other thing is whatever's going on with the bottom of the film, if, there, if that's intentional and if there's a way to redo that around each side, uh, that could be really interesting as well. So the only thing I could think of would be if this, if you, if you were to take this photo using a paper negative and cut it to size and then, um, actually not cut it to size, but like crease it and then tear it along each, each perimeter to size and have it sitting in your camera right like that over your shutter curtain, uh, that could be a really interesting way of replicating that look and having the, per, the edge of the image be an image element that could be really neat to look at. 
From Brendan, we have a photo of different windows and an architectural detail shot. So really interesting things going on here with this detail. Each window has like a slightly different reflection. Up in the top right, we have the sky. The left, we have the window frame. The one down in the middle right, we have some kind of blurry reflection in there. So uh, there's, there's an interesting use of reflection in the windows here and also an interesting use of order because all of these windows are open to the exact same amount. They're all in front of relatively dark glass, but the one up at the top right is showing through the reflection of the window frame that's caught in the window. The one in the left middle has this bright reflection in it. And so there's this, this chaos mixed within the order just a hair. And I think that's a really good eye for combining chaos and order in a photo like this. Other than that, the things we've generally talked about, tonal range, texture, really well done and executed through here. If there were a way to take this photo again, but you can see up in the upper left, like the lines are kind of skewing that direction a little bit. It'd be interesting to see if there's a way to correct that. It doesn't necessarily have to be done with a lens. It could be done in post with Photoshop, or if you have a traditional darkroom pr uh, production method, you could when you have the red gel over your filter and you're focusing, see how moving the corner of your paper could correct that. If you lift it up, I don't think that might work, but if you can bend it backwards, maybe a hair, uh, by putting the, the paper on something slightly smaller than it, and then using something a little bit lower than whatever that object is to allow the corner of the paper to droop just a little bit, that it wouldn't necessarily be easy, but that might correct some of that skewing that's going on in the upper left corner. So um, good eye for an architectural detail that provides an interesting composition and image. From Richard, from Richard Mangle, we have a photo of a dog. And so the image composition here is nice. It's the, the dog's a little bit off center. I don't know, like it's a personal thing, a personal preference, but I do always like a portrait that is a hair off center. Uh, it gives, you know, if, if looking at the, the the portrait subject becomes just a little bit like too intense, especially if they're the portrait subjects looking at the camera, you can either, you can always kind of like move your eyes off to the side for a minute and then look back. So I think the composition here is really pleasing. I think the way that either some static or the breeze is moving the dog's fur up on its left ear is really a, an interesting capture as well. It shows that the, this isn't a posed photo. The dog's just out there, you know, playing or enjoying some sunlight, and, and this is a nice capture. A couple of things to note in the photo are that the, the shadows are kind of muddy looking. So there's not a lot of tonal separation in the darks of the background. It would be interesting to see with this setting what would happen if that that background were isolated and had a bit more tonal separation put into it. Then the uh, the focus also was a hair mist. You can see the the fur on the shoulders is in sharp focus, and then the eyes are a little bit in front of that sharp focus point. So uh, just a couple of things there. But other than that, like the eye for the composition and the subject and getting the dog to look at the camera with that look are really well executed. From Stephen Boyce, we have an architectural shot that is just busting with contrast. Uh, very little use of the mid-range of the zone scale here. You've got a little bit in the top left, but by and large, the majority of this photo is almost, almost to the tone separation of plain white and plain dark. Uh, so really striking use of contrast really also like how the contrast here is used to amplify the shape of the bridge. Like the bridge has an interesting shape, right? It, in so far as you know, standard urban architecture, but you have the way that the straight lines are, are separating these tonal differences and really bringing out the shape of the bridge and the, the, the contrast separation there. And then also interesting is all of the birds' nests underneath the uh, bridge as well, because they are, aside from that blurry lamp in the right side, they're the only thing that's really not straight. 
everything else in this in this photo is angular. And so I think that's a really neat use of that one little element of rounded shape within the photo. So uh, might be worth, if you get a chance to go back here, see what happens if you can step three feet to the right or three feet to the left and how that might change the composition just slightly, only because that tree and um, lamppost in the background do kind of stand out right now since they they break up the otherwise smoothness of the rest of the sky. And it might be worth seeing if there's a way to step to your right a little bit and angle the camera just slightly to crop them out and have the space to the right of that little pedestrian view viewing platform be more just open sky. Pretty nitpicky thing, all things considered. From Wayne, we have a black and white photo here of a tree and a building in a couple of shadows, really uh, structured to compare the, the uh, to kind the structure here is really good at separating the straightness of the building's lines versus the randomness of the tree shadow and the tree that's over there on the right then, which is, I don't think that's the same tree. I could be wrong, it's kind of hard to tell. And then um, also the, the straightness of all of the lines in the shadow of the street sign and so it's a really interesting way to compare and contrast the different shapes that are made by man and the shapes that are made by nature and how much different they are from one another. So uh, really clever capture and use of the black and white medium for that uh, purpose. From Alexa D, we have a photo looking up at the inside of a high tension tower and this replicated shape over and over, lots of triangles and squares very industrial. Almost not quite a silhouette, but kind of flirting with that. Not quite contra -jour because the light is off to the side and uh, casting, casting lit shadows into the structure. And just, you know, this is, this is a photo that all of us take. I, I, look, if you are a black and white photographer, and you tell me you haven't taken this photo, either you don't live near a high tension tower you can stand underneath, or you're fibbing. So we, I've taken this photo, and it's it's one that is a really interesting study on depth and shape, and how a three-dimensional object can look two-dimensional in a setting like this, because of the way that, uh, you know, what the world is three-dimensional, photos are two-dimensional. So one, th two things I would I would think about with another opportunity to take this photo. One is make sure that the camera is really, really well squared up on the middle, right? Because right now the the there's a twist to the the angle of the camera. And the other one would be play around with contrast in this, whether it's in post or whether you're using like a, in a larger to with a high contrast paper or like a number five filter on a variable contrast paper. How would this look if it were squared up and it was just black for the shadow areas of the tower? Then that would really compress the tower. You'd still get the sense of depth because of the way that these center struts are mirrored and getting smaller as they go th up to the center of the, the frame. But you'd also be playing with a lack of depth as well. So you'd have both depth and lack of depth. That could be an interesting execution for this photo as well. From Andrei Jelakovich, we have a photo of a son or grandson, nephew, a, a baby of some sort, looking up at a, um, a mobile or some other plaything in its, in its uh, bed to keep it entertained. Um, First thing right off the bat, you're probably going to notice the focus is on the eye of the toy, not the eye of the baby. So, so we can ask we can ask right away how would this photo be different if the focus point were on the baby's left eye? If we if we had caught that, and you can see also right behind the baby's head, like the texture of the fabric is is also in focus, which kind of emphasizes because the the baby the shape of the baby's head is not in focus it kind of highlights that a little bit further but the use of the back of the setting here i think this the setting is fantastic the the posing and the placement of the baby 
are really nice. The out of focus area in the background, the way that blur is used in the background, also really well executed. So uh, those are all really well done. The, oh, one other thing that would be worth it, if, if you have another opportunity to take a photo of the baby, is cut the tag off of the um, toy because right now it's become a distracting element. So if you take that tag off completely, then you've got the ability to have that that be a less, you know, it's not going to stand out. But, um, you know, other than that, I think there's a lot of things that are going right with the composition and structure. It's just a matter of where the focus point was in the image that that has become a distracting element. From Andrew Kerwan, we have a photo of an old building with a barge and a tree in what I would assume is somewhere in the UK, could be anywhere in Europe. Oh, it doesn't really look like the US, but I could be wrong. Anyway, all that aside, uh, the image structure here is really solid. The tree over on the left creates a boundary for our eyes. And then down on the, the, the right side, we have, if you imagine cropping out that tree, the, Im the image is not nearly as successful because that tree bounds our eyes and it creates depth as well because it's so much closer than the building and the, the boat are. So it, it forces us to look over there and it stands in contrast, the, the random shape of the tree to the relative smoothness of the cloudy sky, the water, the building's uh, stone or concrete structure, the roof and the, and the boat. So all of those things working really well together and as a black and white landscape photo, generally pretty successful as well couple of things to think about with this, and these are super minor, by the way. The bicycle sign, really distracting because it's everything in this photo feels old. The building, the, the bridge on the left behind the tree, the tree, all of these things feel really old and weathered, and they have a lot of character. Bicycle sign doesn't. So if you have this in, in Photoshop, be really easy to just or whatever photo editor you use, be really easy to just clone that out with your clone clone tool. The bollards are also a hair distracting because they are such a sharp uh, difference between white and dark. Again, the sort of thing that you'd have to clone out in Photoshop. Um, as a, you know, if you were thinking of this as a traditional printed photo, really nothing you, that you can do there. Just a couple of things to be mindful of as elements that are, are standing out from the nature of the rest of the photo. So next up from Casey Schmidt, we have a photo that's flirting with the abstract here. It's flirting with just a use of tone and, and nah, not really texture, but mostly tone. It's a photo of a bird flying well overhead in front of clouds that are probably possibly storm clouds, but clearly lit in, in, from the side or from behind and in a less dense region than over to the upper left, which is a much denser, thicker cloud, right? So the focus here is on the clouds. The bird is out of focus. We, we can tell by how smooth and soft it is, which if that's, if that's an intentional use of texture in the photo, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm struggling with that. The wildlife and birds, and this is something I struggle with too, you really have to have a very long lens to photograph them. And I, I don't know how long this lens was, um, but you know, when, when I go out specifically to photograph birds, I'm grabbing like a 300 to 500 millimeter lens. And, and that's about as short as realistically as you can get, unless you've got the ability to get close to them with a, with a photo like this, it can be successful, but the birds got to be in focus and you've got to be able to see the feathers the shape of the feathers on the wings and the tail in order for that to be really successful. And in a perfect world, it should be doing something more interesting than flying, like carrying a mouse in its claws or a stick in its beak, something like that. So um, those are just a couple of tips if you want if you want to try something like this again with a, with a bird photograph to go for it. The other way to photograph birds and wildlife like that, and there's nothing whatsoever wrong with this. I, I know some photographers will say, oh, you, you, this is against the rules or whatever thing. It's not. Go to a place with a controlled setting, a zoo, a bird sanctuary, um, whatever, and go to a place where you can get photos up close of a bird. 
there is there is zero wrong with that whatsoever. And the photos you can get can be absolutely striking as well. So just a couple things to think about there. I do think that the use of the gradation within the clouds, if the bird had been a larger aspect of the photo and had been in focus, I think this could have been a, a hugely successful silhouette photo in, with, with this background. From Clay Williams, we have a photo of a um, Aussie Shepherd or Collie, one of the two. Kind of hard to tell in black and white. I'm going to go with Collie. Uh, super cute pop and a super good use of lighting in an environmental setting. So uh, this is one of those images that has a nice use of the zone scale from dark to bright. You actually almost lose the top of the Collie's head in the light coming in through the window in the background. Uh, one of the things there, if you have a blind on the window, See if, see if there's a way to, to mute that light just a little bit because it is creating a harsh lighting on the, the dog's head. And then the, if you had shifted over to the right a bit and had the chair not right behind the dog, uh, the chair is a little bit of a distracting element in the photo there as well. Uh, other than that, like you've got the dog looking at the photo, eyes are sharply in focus, nose to ears are in, fo in, in suitable focus, pause. So everything about the the dog part of this photo looks intentional and well done. It's just a matter of how the background fits in with the rest of the photo here. From a technical perspective, in terms of uh, lighting, use of tones and textures, those things are working out pretty darn well. From David Higgins, we have a picture of a couple of old trucks in a, um, in a field. I'm curious about the, the surround on, on this photo. And I'm wondering, is this... Polaroid. It's a little bit hard hard to tell what's causing the what looks kind of like tape or something like that around the perimeter of the image. It's a really neat aspect of the image. Uh, you've pr heard probably heard me say in other photos that uh, a white border for, is something I used to do all the time. Doesn't really add anything to your photo unless you are framing it. This is an exception, and what we talked about with uh, what looked kind of like torn paper and a a handful of photos ago is an exception because this looks like an intentional element of the photo that is trying to call attention to itself as being a traditional film photo. And so if if the border is done with purpose and intention, I have no issue with it whatsoever. Uh, and, and it can also create a lot of visual interest. One of the things that's really interesting here is like how small the central area of focus is and then immediately Everything goes kind of blurry. I'm, I'm struggling to figure out what kind of camera would have taken this. Um, yeah, I really don't know. It's a fascinating photo. Anyway, um, I do really like the way that the nature of the equipment is used in this photo. And this is one that shows that your, your medium and your camera choice can make a photo. So imagine this photo in, with technical perfection right? Imagine it being sharp corner to corner and like it just kind of be boring. But in this photo, with the way that the subject is structured and with the way that the equipment is used, then a whole lot of visual interest is born out of that, that setup. So really well done and good instinct on how to use equipment to create a visual, com visually compelling image. From Emma Bockelman, we have a photo of a couple of stairs going up into a shaded area, garden path, something like that. And as we've talked about frequently throughout this video, really nice use of uh, tone across the range, good use of textures, good use of, um, of a lot of those different things. And also we can tell because of the lower left corner that this is a film photo. And one thing, by the way, like, I, I think maybe only one or two photos that we've seen so far in this video stand out to me as maybe not being film. Uh, I'm really happy to see how many of you this year, this is more than I think any year in the past, have submitted black and white and across the board in all of the, the categories, film photos uh, rather than, than digital. You guys are doing absolutely staggeringly good work with your film images. So film images are really much harder to turn into really uh, into technically perfect images than digital photos and the level of work that across the board everyone has submitted 
on film has been really good. The best this year of any of the years I've done these contests. So the only thing I could think of for this photo uh, would be like, what, what is it? What are we trying to get from the story of this photo? What if there were something on the stairs? It could be someone's feet as they're walking down. I don't know if that would work out or not, but it would be something that would add a little bit of visual interest. It could be a squirrel or a toad or something like that it could be an interesting thing. It could honestly be like a single boot. Like if this were out on a hike or a walk and you just took your shoe off and set it there and did your best not to step in a puddle and get your sock all wet while you did that, what would, what would that do then? So, so the idea is that what, whenever, whenever you look at a scene, and this is, this is something I don't even do perfectly all the time, I, I won't lie, what could the photo be? What, what do I have here that's 90% of the way? And what do I have that would, would give me that added 10% to, to add a really interesting subject to this, to this setting that would take it, pardon the pun, a step above where it's at right now? From Jay Yan Lee, we have a photo of a garage door with a plant in the foreground, truck off to the side, and a partial building in the background. There's something about this image composition that could work, right? There are some things going on here that are really interesting. I think the way that this white building's structure partially cuts off that distant building is an interesting idea. I think there's a way that could make this sort of image layout work in a compelling manner. The use of, of tonal range across here, again, really good. Different textures, again, really good. A couple of the distracting elements, the truck becomes distracting because uh, it just stands out so much. Like everything else in this photo looks older, right? The electrical clearly was installed after this building. The building's an older structure. The driveway is an older structure, but the build, the truck is compared to everything else relatively new, but it does add an interesting texture variation to the rest of the photo because aside from the glass and the, the garage door, nothing else really in this photo is smooth. So I'm not sure how I'd handle that. Um, and the, but then the, the big distracting element is the branches over to the left side because they cut off so much of the building. So again, like I said, like there's something really, really interesting about using an object in the foreground to cut off part of an object in the background, especially if that object in the background becomes an important part of the structure. Something there could really work well. Um, it just needs a little bit of, of revisioning just to think about how that could happen. And lastly, before we get into the honorable mentions from Joshua God, we have a photo of this rose in an old weathered uh, planter basket. Great selection of, of image uh, elements, especially in that planter basket. I think that is really neat. You've got the rose, which is smoothish in the petals, the leaves, which are smoothish, and then this planter basket, which is very weathered and has a ton of interesting texture as well as tone in it. So the only issue with what's the, the way the image is structured is how much else is going on in the sides, right? You've got this cut off watering can, the cut off plants on the bottom, a little bit of cut off on the plants on the right. So if we imagine like if this is your backyard garden, when you have your, your roses growing next spring, imagine going back to this plant. And if you can get a rose in a similar situation or setup to that, how would the photo look if you shot it portrait orientation with the rose at the top taking up half of the photo and then the uh, planter basket in the bottom taking up half the photo and don't even like have the entire rose like get in there as close as your lens will let you and feel free to crop off parts of the rose this would be an interesting subject to try like 10 or 12, 14 photos of just the rose in the planter basket and see how that forces you to sort of revision the subject because there is, there is a concept here structurally that is working. Just the, the angle of the photo and the distance from the subject are hampering that. 
Our first of three honorable mentions comes from Antonio King. And this is a photo of the moon behind a rocky ledge. As we've seen with the rest of Antonio's shots, I mean, from a technical perspective, like spot on, really well executed. Uh, the rocks are super sharp. The sky has this beautiful gradient in it with no banding, not always an easy thing to do. I say, having struggled with that quite extensively this year myself. And then the moon is really fascinating because you can see the ripples of the atmosphere in the moon's perimeter. And uh, so the moon is not, I mean, it's not smooth, but at the distance we see it from here on Earth, it can look smooth in photos. But the, the, the way that the image, the, the moon is textured on the perimeters stands really in opposition to the smoothness of the gradient in the sky. And then the foreground is like this big, like textured jumble of tonal ranges and textures and things like that. And it's just really a, a very sm very interesting use of all of those different aspects of black and white photography yeah. in a dominant uh, dominant image element, the, the foreground that is. So I think a really interesting use of the foreground and the textures throughout the images and, and generally speaking, pretty darn well executed. From Joseph Shalmo, we have a stunning textbook use of fog. Uh, this is really a captivating capture of the battleship with what looks like an old sailboat and an unloading crane in, in this foggy setting in the water. Uh, and the way that the fog lines up just under the turret guns of the battleship is uh, just really an absolutely perfect use of setting. So I know we've talked a lot about this video, like darks and whites and and use of the, the zone scale. And this is one where that is not happening. There's like one little bright white light off to the side that I might actually clone out if this were my photo. And there's nothing that really is super dark. Like this photo lives from about zone three to zone six, give or take. And uh, just really shows that the black and white can do really well with a full range of zones. And it can do really well with a truncated zone. But here, what we're seeing is that that truncated contrast feels really intentional and absolutely contributes to the overall uh, nature of the image. Our third honorable mention comes from Jared. And Jared, every year, submits exactly one photo just for black and white. Um, you know, and he he always presents something which is visually very striking. Uh, this is an incredibly good setting choice for this photo. Like, look at the setting. It's concrete and graffiti and what looks like either wood and or wood and rusted metal up above it. The sky, the sky is a little over-processed, um, but that's going to be something that's going to come out of the, the amplification of the dark tones in the shadows there. And, uh, but then all of that is just slightly out of focus. Like, look at how just very slightly blurry the entire setting is compared to the absolutely sharp focus from wrist to, like, glasses of the subject right in the middle of the photo. From a technical execution point standpoint, very hard to do. Makes me, honestly makes me wonder if the background was blurred in post as a, as a separate adjustment layer or something like that, because uh, that would be really challenging to do uh, tech from, a, from, a, from an aperture and, and technical perspective. Anyway, all that aside, everything that we've talked about throughout this video, tonal range, textures, texture variation, things like that, really good. I usually don't like the upward look of, of you know, upward pointed camera shots, but this does well with that. Uh, and I think this is a captivating image to look at, uh, you know, just really doing well across the board in that regard. Our second place shot comes from Dave Carrera, uh, who also this year, I think, just sent in one photo for black and white. And what we have is a silhouette of a photographer. Absolutely beautiful capture. The sky really is uh, flawless in this. The use of sky and, and sunlight, I'm assuming sunset, at the ocean, uh, Pacific Ocean, I'm sure, to 
create the silhouette is uh, phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. And the uh, the silhouette itself is an interesting silhouette. The you know the, one of the reasons one of the things I, I looked at with this is you now the silhouette of the photographer bleeds into the silhouette of the rocks. I'm kind of curious what would happen if there was a bit of a separation there. What if the photographer was still completely in silhouette, but where his legs meet the rocks? What if going down his legs from there for just a little bit, not all the way to his feet or not even all the way to his knees, frankly, there was a little bit of a glow in the rocks to sort of separate him from that. Then you would have a silhouette with a little bit of depth in the silhouette image which could work really well. The other thing that I thought about was what if this was a bit more of a contra image where there was texture and tone, albeit only a hint, in the shoreline, the rocks, and maybe to a lesser extent, even the photographer. Uh, as a silhouette photo, it, it really checks all the boxes and has done very well. Um, and I think just the all of, all of the things I just suggested are only like, what if, I mean, what if we played around with that? Not even things that I think the image necessarily needs. Which takes us to our winning entry for black and white. And I, I think the person who submitted it knows their name is about to be called and is very happy. Uh, Frank Wooters submitted this multiple exposure portrait. And it's this is a really uh, interesting multiple exposure. You know, a lot of times if you see the multiple exposures where it's like, person looks at you and looks at the camera and then looks profile to the camera and they kind of blend those together. Those are, ah, this is a really well executed self portrait in the creative self portrait vein. Cause it's, it's like the same guy's face over and over and the same subject's face over and over and positioned like blended into itself really, uh, in, a, in an interesting manner. You know, the, um, the way that the photos are all put together is visually compelling. So the only things I can I can look at that I think of about this are super nitpicky. The blending on the left side face by the by the primary photo's right ear, the hair there seems a little bit cut off. I know just might need a little bit more of a um a feather on that layer with a an eraser brush in the like the 10%, and then just kind of doing it creatively to track the tones of the hair there. Uh, that's the only place where the blending really kind of stands out in, in the photo. And then the other thing is if you look at all of the photos in the center of the face, they're all kind of looking in the same direction. I'm kind of curious, uh, what if there were a photo like the where where he was also looking at the camera again or in a different direction? It might be an interesting thing to play around with that uh, hair. I, but this is, when I looked at this, this photo for the first time, I was like, this is such a creative use of, uh, of multiple exposure creation in post and just absolutely uh, really a captivating photo because it just shows so many different angles of the subject's face in one shot. So really, oh um, I, yeah, I was, I was jealous. I didn't think of this because this is a really creative idea. So that's it for black and white. And tomorrow we're going to talk about the overall portfolio contest and take a look at all the portfolios for everyone who submitted in all five categories. See you guys then.